Hi, it's Gadget UK here again, back for part four of the Amiga 32-bit Repair-a-thon series. So in part three, we were looking at the four A1200 motherboards. I think we uh, managed to fix uh, one or two of those in the previous video. Um, I'll stick some links down below to that if you want to catch up with the series. But the way we left things, I was looking at, I think, the third board that had a uh, problem with the mouse and a button. Whenever you move the mouse, the button would fire, uh, and vice versa. I'll show you here, just watch. Continuity. These are the two things in question, the buttons. One's up and one's fire. I don't know which way around they are. And there's a short here. So I've eliminated this thing here. But those are joined, they shouldn't be. Now I'm not sure if this is the next obvious thing or not, but I'm thinking take this connector off. Well there we go. I don't know how, but that was the fault. So the solder was the clue. Maybe it's this Oh, I don't know. There's a solder point there, but is that for me just... That's not where it was joining though, I don't think. You can see a bit of copper there, anyway. There's no join now. So, was it this bit of copper here with that solder point shorted, maybe? I don't know. It seems strange how we took that off and the problem's gone away. But can you see down there, look, someone has been tinkering on that. Without a doubt, it's like solder all up here. How would it get right up here? Can't explain that at all. Unless, see here, that trace there, maybe it was joining, but I'm sure I inspected that. That wasn't even bare a minute ago. So that's only as a result of trying to solder, I think. But we had a short all the way up until that came off. There was nothing underneath it, so that's really odd. Right, so I put that back on and the short was back again, so it's really weird, isn't it? And uh, what I've done here, can you see, I've just bend this pin up a little bit. Can you see a little bit of metal below? It's the connection for this one here. So, someone has been tinkering with this, and if you look at the plastic, can you see it looks a bit melted? I think what I'm going to do with this is get a tiny piece of heat shrink tubing and slide it up to mask that whole pin there. Bend it back into profile and fit it back on the board. Does that make sense? So that it's totally isolated here with some tubing. Yeah, so you can see what I mean there. Just that little bit like that, that should be enough. It'll just squash up a little bit and then I'll use hot air at about 100 degrees just to shrink that on the top there and hopefully that might make the difference between it shorting to that point there and not. Yeah, so I'm not even sure if that's going to do the job, to be honest. Because it feels like it really should be a little bit further up. But I can push it up, look. <sighs> so let's just clean it all up. I didn't show you putting those back on, but it was just that easy. Under magnification, just use my metal tool to hold the capacitor down, solder one side, solder the other, use a bit of braid. Had a bit of flux and reflow, um, just to get just enough solder, but not too much, and they look okay. And retesting that after doing that little bit of tubing, you can see it works. It works fine. That was the issue. So the expansion port issue, I cleaned with a cotton bud. Can you see? Oxidisation. I used some deoxit on there, or deoxit gold. It's designed for gold-plated contacts and things. Uh, yeah, and that worked first time. I would. I tried this card in and out of here, I would say 20 times at different angles, I wiped it with IPA on both sides, cleaned out the socket, nothing, it would never see it. Um, and then after cleaning it with the oxide, it worked first time. So yeah, that's the first time I've experienced a problem like that, where the connector looked dead clean, I couldn't see anything wrong with it, but the oxide seems to have done it. I'll power it off and we'll disconnect it and reconnect it, and just see if that makes any difference. You can see it's a relatively good fit that but that trust me that had been off and on off and on 20 times it never detected it once so let's try again hopefully it's there yeah it's there fantastic that's all it was which means this board is now a hundred percent i've got to test the pcm cia i haven't tested that yet but i've tested the uh you know, the ram cia serial port parallel port ide floppy drive joystick, we just fixed the mouse, we've now got the expansion port working, so yeah, it's just PC MCIA. 
The only thing I need to do quickly with these is test the keyboard. Now I've not got a keyboard I can easily connect up to these. What I have got is a partially working flex ribbon, which should do me. As long as I get the same consistent, I think there's only one key doesn't work on it or something, or two keys. So as long as I get the same behaviour on every single keyboard, I'm going to be convinced that that's okay. Uh, and you can usually tell generally because the ones that had keyboard issues have got new MCUs on these. One or two of these have had the MCU replaced. So, uh, And you can see the connectors and the caps and things around there look absolutely perfect. So I would be amazed if there was a keyboard issue on these anyway. And it would have been reported by the people that sent me these. So I've booted from IDE there. You can see we've got 2.27 meg uh, free of fast. So yeah, some of that is used by the number of uh, drives. Now if I plug in my compact flash, uh, you know, PCMCIA adapter, hopefully, is that in? Now it's in. Uh, yeah, there we go, empty. So that has appeared. And we've got Battle Squadron. I've got the speaky cables connected, so let's try it straight from the PCMCIA card. And that's working. Sweet. I just have a play of that for a few minutes actually. So I borrowed the DAC off this board earlier. This is the one that's not doing uh, very much at all. Um, I've got a replacement DAC here from Analogic. So our pads were all nice and clean from when I previously removed that. I'm just going to remove this cap. What I did in order to get that off, I put some cap to tape around that. but. Uh, I've got some new capacitors for some of these boards anyway. Not all of them need recapping because some of them have been done before. This looks like one of the ones that's been done previously. I th oh no, hang on, it might not be. This might be one that needs recapping. Yeah, it is. Corrosion down there, corrosion up here on this one. So this is one that needs recapping anyway. So I'm going to pull that cap off. We'll get this on. This chip has been tested as far as I understand, so I don't see any point in socketing it. Um, yeah, we'll get it on. And then I'll put two of my Kickstart ROMs in here. I'm not sure I mentioned, but I killed two of the uh, Kickstart 3 ROMs earlier. Not in this board, on one of the other boards. You'll notice that there's uh, one extra pin uh, on either side of the socket here, on both sockets. And uh, see so this arrow here? You've got to get the ROMs aligned to the left-hand side, with pin 1 obviously on here, sorry, the right-hand side, pin 1 on the left-hand side. So yeah, I had it misaligned by one row, and they both went nuclear instantly. Switched off tested them both roms are dead so uh, yeah holding my hands up i killed some roms it's the sort of thing if you're not careful and you're not observant it's easy to do things like that i haven't added any additional solder here so that's going to be part of the problem yeah there we go that's that off yeah i would never go to any other method now other than using uh, two irons it's so easy to remove something like that uh, let's just clean the pad up while we're here as well you can of course get uh, tweezers, hot tweezers, that do the same thing, you know, with a bit more convenient. But the cheap ones, well, they are that, they are cheap. I wouldn't go for the cheap ones, I don't think they're much good for things like this. They tend to find they've got really giant prongs on. Not really suited to small components of this size. So pin one is up here, just next to the serial uh, number, I think. Is that what that is? Yes it is. Uh, and there's a one mark in here, so I just need to carefully align this. I'm going to do this bit off camera, get it so it's totally aligned with all four sides correctly. You know, look at it top down. Uh, and then just try and use a really fine tip on your iron and a load of solder and just solder one point. Inspect it again and then solder on the other side. I've got some flux down this side here and I'm just going to have a go using the rusty Antex iron here. So the key here is to, you know, try and heat the pad, but also heat the pin, and then just try and drag slowly across. With this iron, I'm having to go pretty slow, because the heat doesn't transfer very well with this iron, I found. So I swapped over to a working board here just to test this process because I'm getting very little, I'll show you, very little across the serial port on the uh, the board from hell. Uh, you can see I've got a serial cable here, so we've got receive, transmit and ground, and the receive and transmit are flipped. And below, you might be able to hear, it's a bit noisy, I've got my A4000 that you've not seen yet, and I'm using that as the serial receiver, if you like. 
and you can see that there and I've literally all I've done is switch on that A1200 and then I switched it off very quickly just in order to capture this first bit because this is what I was interested in you see this bit pattern here these four characters well there might be five characters there there's like a space and a, a P uh, an asterisk and a, a U um, and then it explains below what those are to help you work out bit errors to Paula um, anyway if I switch this off and swap over to the other board and when I say switch this off I'm just switching off the 1200 in fact the 1200 was already off but anyway we'll just disconnect it pull off our serial cable swap the ROMs these ROMs are really easy to get out the original mass ROMs aren't so this is the board from hell uh, right, the high one goes in the lower socket here. I'm making sure we got pin one right so we don't fry the ROM like I did earlier on one of them, two of the mask ROMs. And get that one there correct. Connect up our serial. I'm just going to restart that terminal program there so you can see I'm using Handshake. I'm sorry, it's a bit over bright. And the only thing you need to change is the board rate to 9600. And that's it, just leave it like that. So if I now connect power to that motherboard, uh, just checking everything's right with the ROMs it is, watch. I switch the power, and nothing. It's intermittent, it hardly ever does anything, but sometimes, there we go, see that flash? That shows you it received something, and again, when it went off, strangely enough, and again, so I don't know what to make of that. It's like there's something coming across the serial port, but next to nothing. So we're at a bit of a crooked angle there. I just want to show you, sometimes time can actually help you. And what I mean by that, I've been scoping various things on here and everything's kind of looking normal. See that green? This is Diagram. Now, Diagram, when it does the chip ram, t uh, chip ram test very early on, it flickers between gr green and black. And over a period of time of me, probing things and I've just checked that I hadn't shorted anything here you know it's not like I accidentally shorted two pins while scoping power cycling it, it does the same thing after it's been on for maybe two or so minutes then you get this green uh, the green and black very 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 slowly and this is a clue actually this shows me that it's probably stepping through the ROM sequentially as it's supposed to be doing but there's a delay there's a delay, this is something either, I'm hesitant to say a clock problem, if it was a clock problem the clock would be like divided by I don't know, 4096 or you know, be a ridiculous amount I don't think it's a div clock division issue, it's, it's far too delayed, it's more than 4096 it's incredibly slow, if you compare this to how fast it should be running it's tens of thousands of times uh, or more slower than it should be but you can nevertheless see green screen that stays up for the same amount of time as the black screen which shows me that it is processing but something somewhere is delaying that whole process so uh, the question is what I mean is it a clock thing I don't think it's a clock thing if I'm honest I think it could be something DTAC related or something I don't know there's a signal that it's, something's waiting on somewhere I don't know enough about the architecture here to understand precisely what might be causing that I mean CIAs is an obvious thing but looking at some of the source code for Diagram which I did yesterday I stepped through it and I'll go back and check it again in a minute but I'm going to leave this powered up like this just to see if we get further than this let me just switch back to the other channel you can hear the A4000 is powered below and if we go on to there yeah so I've got the serial connected up nothing there still but I don't think it's got far enough but then having said that I think one of the first things it should do is write out to the serial it could be a polar problem this it could be a polar so I've chosen the wrong channel on this uh, side yeah I've got the 1200 connected up. oh hang on yeah green still I've got the 1200 connected up by a composite so as I say, I'll go and uh, have a look through the code again. We'll just leave that up and report back in a bit to see if anything else happens. Like, do we get any 
change to the display other than the green and black flashing. It'd be nice if we've got some text coming up, that would be very good. Anyway, while that's just sat there on a green screen, I just want to show you something. One thing I've just been checking is the interrupts. I've checked INT2 and INT6, which come from, I think INT6 comes from here, INT2 comes from the other CIA over here. Those are high, so it's not like those are interrupting the system, because that's the sort of thing that could cause this really extended boot uh, thing here, with the uh, delays and things going on. Although I would expect it to kind of crash if it wasn't handled properly, so I don't really know what's going on there. But anyway, the uh, interrupt, I think, is it come out on this pin here? Let's just check this, hang on. Oh, you know, it's not that one. I think it's that top one there. I need to go and check the, um, my photo. I've just took a photo. But it's pin 17 here on Alice as well, for just a count around here. Just bear with me. So that's pin 17 there. It's actually high at the moment. It was low before. When it was doing the, the stuff it was doing, it was low. One, seventeen. Yeah, it's high just now. So Alice was like in a constant interrupt. I was watching that, it was like low all the time. It was toggling between black and uh, green there. So we don't appear to have got any further there, and it's been about an additional 10 minutes actually. Just switch back to see if there is anything on serial, but I doubt it. Yeah, nothing there. So at this point it seems to have stalled, it could still be running code, it could still be waiting for something. So I've checked the halt and the bus error signals, we checked the interrupts, the interrupts are all high at the moment, so it's not like stuck in an interrupt. And if we uh, check some of the I think there's a data bus connection see it's pulsing see so it's like it hasn't crashed it isn't resetting it hasn't stalled it's just sat waiting for something so i was looking at some technical documentation related to the uh, dsx signal um related to gale and i saw something there that suggests that the weight signal that comes from here may influence the dsx and dsx1 signals so I'm just wondering if there's kind of some sort of weight going on due to that. So I might target the 244 related to the, the, that signal here and remove it. Uh, right, well I've ended up looking at this here and uh, I'm not sure if I'm going insane but this is actually a different component that should be on there. It's an AND gate. If I look at the other board, now it could be that it's had mods, I don't know, but someone's been tinkering because they've obviously damaged the resistor, you know, the pad that was originally down here. This has got a HC32, and it does say on the schematics it should be a HC32, sorry, an F32, uh, an OR gate. So how have we ended up with a completely different gate on there? I am a bit confused by that actually. Is that the issue? I can't even see whether that looks like that. I mean, it looks like it's been reflowed, but. I don't know. I'm going to go and have a look to see where that sits on the schematic session. Oh my god, I'm even more confused. Looking at PCB Explorer for more or less the same revision board as this. This is shown on the schematics as a 74F74. So it's like we've got three potential different ICs can sit in this exact position here. The board layout looks identical, so. I am really, really confused, to say the least. Uh, what I do know is if I compare to this board, which again is almost identical, isn't it? If you look at the layout here, someone's fitted this on, I'm guessing, retrospectively. Maybe that mod there is not designed to work with this IC. Uh, now, if I swap this for one of these, that looks bigger, so that makes me think it's been fitted afterwards. What other modifications do we need to do? Hmm. Now, I think changing that is going to be fruitless unless I find any clues as to a reason to change it. Um, because looking at the other boards here, it seems like Commodore fitted different ships on here, depending on the day of the week, more or less. It's like you've got, uh, I've seen these with an F32 here, I've seen one with an F32 here instead of there. And then I've seen one with a 7474 here. I don't know, it's, uh, it's very strange to say the least. I don't know why they've done so much messing around around there with different components depending on the revision of the board. It's quite scary really.
So I've been scalping all sorts of things here. There's the CPU clock. Uh, the read write pin is stuck high. It's not showing there. It's going between high and high impedance. DSAC 0, DSAC 1. Uh, yeah, everything around here is kind of looking okay actually. That's a bit of a screwy signal, but that's one of the clocks, and that's another one. Slightly less in amplitude, but it's around the 4 volt mark, so there's nothing all there. Maybe that one could be a bit cleaner. Uh, then we get onto some of the RAM related signals here, like RAS and CAS. Uh, for just adjust the hold. Anyway, everything uh, yeah, is kind of looking okay, actually. So the only other thing to point out is U8. CIA is high all the time, it's enabled, whereas the one nearest the keyboard connector, uh, is that U7? Yeah, it is. That's, that goes between high and low, which makes me, uh, you know, obviously realise that it's looking at the CIA there. The read-write pin is predominantly high, it goes high impedance high, uh, and I can show you that. So that's the read-write pin, it's not going low, but uh, that makes me think it's actually reading. I don't know if there's no other clues at all with this. So I was just about to package these up ready for collection. Uh, you can see this one's a partial recap. I've marked the caps I have replaced with a red dot. I didn't have a full set for this and to be honest the caps on this board were very good. It looks like it may have been recapped before so it's not got, I don't think it's got the original caps on, could be wrong. It's just the 47s and the 100s need swapping out so uh, the company this is going back to can do that themselves if they uh, want to do that. Anyway this is the one with the green screen so it was just a, a dry solder joint on one of the chips there and I've just you know cleaned up a few things but I just want to finish cleaning up here you can see there's uh, some stains and things around there little smears and what have you so we'll just carefully wipe those off and then I'll just inspect on both sides to make sure there's nothing needs any attention so this one's all done I'm not going to re-reflow things that have been done before you know this has been reflowed uh, by somebody in the past it may have even been replaced uh, I think the uh, chip, three chips here look factory, so that one's not had much work, really, this board. But yeah, I'm not going to go over and over other things that just really don't need it. Uh, yeah, it's looking pretty good on both sides of that board, I think. So this is the one with the DAC problem. We had that wire there that needed to go through to the other side. And also a problem with the clock uh, signal, I think. But there was a problem with the wire here as well. You can just see... I plugged it, you know, there's a piece of Kynar through there. Uh, and again, this is one of the ones where somebody else has swapped uh, a few chips and stuff on here, so I'm not going to clean up the, the solder points on that. It's all good. Uh, I've just cleaned around with IPA. This is one of the ones that's had a full recap. I had two layers of Captain tape back there. Can you see just the top of that? It's just a little bit marked there, despite having two layers of Captain tape. So when I did the other ones, I put four layers of Captain tape. Uh, yeah, that was a lesson learned. Uh, and this particular one, was really fussy, I think, if this is the right one, uh, with the expansions. And can you see the gold contacts there? They just look a bit weird. Uh, so that has been cleaned previously. I'll go with that again with some deoxid gold now. Um, but that one is, other than that, is ready to go back. It's uh, nice and clean on both sides here. No worries at all. And the last of the three 1200s that are going back, I completely recapped this one, so you can see no damage there on that one, you know, because I used four layers of Captain tape there. Uh, I couldn't find anything really wrong with this one. It was marked to say, uh, I forgot what, exactly what I did, I did a few things to it, but it says, it, it was marked to say, it reads workbench disc, but not a game disc. But you know what, it works with all discs I've thrown at it, uh, regardless. And uh, IDE works fine, all games from uh, hard disc run fine. It's another one of these where two chips have been replaced previously, in fact three. So, I'm not going to reflow around there, the solder points are good, I have inspected that, uh, and it's had a good clean and stuff. So, I'll go and give this another test, but this has had quite a lot of testing as well, and I could not find a problem. The only other thing to point out here is on the external drive, and I tested this, um, it's got a um, wire there, you can see that, I've checked, it is insulated at the top of that, so that can't be causing the problem either. So, it's a bit of an odd one, that. It's a bit of an odd one. So it's a good job I'm fully testing these. I've got a last minute problem here with this board. You can see here, um, this is a working board. 
those are the three boot options and you've got DF1. DF1's got a boot priority of minus 10. Now I've never seen that before but apparently if you've got a game disc which I've just put in there and you just boot, if I just do that, if I just cancel, hang on, I haven't changed anything there, I just cancel and just do boot, it will boot from DF1. So you can see it's actually booting from DF1. That other machine is not doing that and it's not even detecting disc changes on DF1 but it does seek the drive when it's booting up. So uh, there's something weird going on with it. Anyway, at least I know it's okay on this board. Tested the other one as well. Well, the answer on this one was that crazy wire. <laughs> it was that wire on the underside. I compared to a decent board. It's not supposed to be there. I don't know what that wire was doing, but that was the issue. So I've just removed that wire. And now I've thoroughly tested the floppy drives again, just to make sure, but yeah, it's booted. As you can see, you've not got sound connected at the moment, but that's booted from DF1. So this is the other board that I've just used to compare. I'm just gonna show you some interesting things, how it behaves. Um, and you can see I did uh, remove that wire. I don't know what it was now. It was like from here to here or something like that. Uh, yeah, in fact, that's exactly where it was. So I think it was like the ready signal they were doing something with or the disc change signal or even both. I don't know. I suspect somebody has modified that board in the past to work with a, a certain external drive. It could have been a DIY one. They did themselves that had a PC floppy drive in it and uh, yeah they've uh, cheaped out if you like by modifying the board rather than the drive um, and that's caused weird issues that's why it wasn't detecting the disc change properly but after having done that and that's on df1 by the way df0 has always behaved properly on this board but that's the only thing i can find uh, and i'll just show you the interesting behavior we'll show you on this one first if i power it on and if you watch the drive here it reads it this is just letting it boot normally and it's actually booting from IDE, okay? That's the first thing. If you've not got IDE connected, it will boot from DF1, and it boots okay. And I can show you that as well. If you remove the compact flash card, and if you wait for it to time out looking for the drive, it then will boot from here, and it will boot, and it will boot successfully. So this is something I've learned about these. This is I didn't know you could boot from DF1 like this, but it's also interesting how it behaves differently. So you'll see without a hard disk connected, this particular game, and this could just be related to this game, can you see? The graphics are okay, okay? If I power that off and we boot a different way, I'll show you. Now this is where things get interesting. If I connect a compact flash card up, now you remember previously when the compact flash is connected, it will auto boot from the compact flash. Now if I hold both mouse buttons down, we get our boot menu there, and if we go to boot options, choose df1 and we just choose use and then boot and these behave exactly the same way now by the way this is the the working board that's not had any issue there the other board look there you go look at that this is why i went back to testing this board I was like why is it corrupted there when you try to boot from df1 using the boot options but without a hard disconnected boot from df1 it works fine so uh, yeah that's just something interesting but it happens on all these boards i've tested all three of them they all do exactly the same thing it's really weird, isn't it, that you, you get these corruptions only if there's a hard disk connected. If there isn't a hard disk connected, it will auto-boot from DF1 and you don't get a problem. But it could just be this game. So despite that 1200 working fine with a floppy drive now, there was something niggling in the back of my mind. I thought, I've removed that wire. Um, they must have caught a trace, so I've got it back at the box again, even though I tested it. I'm sure it's okay. It probably isn't in respect to the ready signal. So I've just just checked on Amiga PCB Explorer. And I'm glad I did because pin 34, which is here on the internal connector, should go up here to pin one. And there's no connectivity. So we need a wire from here to here. <coughs> this incidentally is the ready signal. So without that, I think some commercial games would struggle to load actually you may find like i am where june where i have where june works okay but uh yeah other games will not so that is the issue and you may be wondering why is there a mod being done to this what is this all about and this is from when scom took over um you know they bought uh, the amiga division of commodore or whatever i think amiga technologies was it and then uh started selling the remaining stock but they uh, for whatever reason they couldn't get drives so they used PC drives 
and uh, did this modification to use standard uh, drive rather than the uh, you know custom Shugart one or whatever that uh, they were intended to use. And the net result is if you don't, you know if you try using a proper Amiga drive, which is I guess what the uh, owner of this board has been trying to do here, because most people are going to use Amiga drives with Amiga systems these days. Um, yeah, you're going to get this issue. So let's uh, just join that there. It doesn't need to be a very uh, long wire, I guess. It can sort of just trail between there and then come down here a little bit. Leave a little bit of length on it. And a final test there, just booting from my uh, other external drive. That's working okay. And it's working as you can see. I've not got sound connected just now. Uh, yeah, I literally uh, just had to unbox this. <laughs> it was bothering me. I, need, I thought about it last night and thought I'll do that tomorrow. So, yeah, anyway, I'm glad that's done. The ready signal is correct on this. So, all games should work on it. So the other three boards were about to go back and uh, Raj actually wanted me to just return this board. You know, when I mentioned I'd spent a few days on it already, he was like, oh, just send it back, doesn't matter. Send the other three with it, you know, uh, we'll be all right kind of thing. And uh, you know what I'm like? I can't just let something be faulty and not get to a conclusion, even if I can't find a replacement part, as long as I understand what the fault is. So I've said, can I have a look at it? And he says, yes, all right, you can keep looking at it, no worries. Um, in the meantime, I figure I want to order a CIA, I've been meaning to do it for a while, a spare one for my 1200 um, and my 4000, just because I ain't got a spare of uh, the PLCC ones. Um, and I'm thinking about this particular issue, you know, this, uh, you know, it seemed seemingly booting, but taking forever to boot. You know, the green and black flashes take a very long period of time. There's no text on the display. I haven't left it on. I guess I would have to leave it on for a few hours in order to get to some sort of display. But there's nothing on the serial port either. So besides that CIA, you know, I'm going to swap the right-hand side CIA on the board, I think, um, with the spare that I've ordered. I'll socket it up so that I don't have to commit to soldering on my spare. But I'm going to order a Paula. Um, and the, like I say, there's two reasons. One, we're getting no serial. Well, your serial comes out of here. So you never know. Um, the bottom half of this does get warm, not boiling hot, but warm after about three seconds of power on, which is, I, I think is unusual. I'm not 100% sure. Um, and the other thing that I'm thinking is, you can see the interrupts coming here, and I checked these, none of them are like stuck uh, low, so it's not like we're stuck in an interrupt scenario. But the very fact that this is an interrupt, you know, controls the interrupts, I am wondering if this is sending something to the CPU and slowing the CPU down. So, I don't know, it's either what the CIA, because CIA's timers, um, it could even be the CIA that has already been replaced, so I might have to swap both CIAs yet. But uh, yeah, we'll try that. I've ordered a CIA and a Paula, we'll give it a go. So in the previous video when I mentioned the convoluted uh, reset chain, you can see it here, it fits on a page, it's ridiculous, look how many things there are, you know how many sequences, it starts over here, the power uh, OK, this is like a, a four pin, uh, you know, little SOP device, it looks like a transistor but it's not, um, yeah, and your five volts and ground are connected and then you get a power OK, you know, it goes from uh, high to, uh, does it go low, hang on, this is there, it says well dear search, we shall pull it high, yes, yeah, so it starts low and then it goes high, um, so there's various connectors and test points and things to measure some of these signals from as well. Uh, then it goes into the keyboard uh, controller, which generates a KB reset, which goes to Gale. Uh, and then, you know, obviously you've got connections here to the expansion edge connector as well. And Gale goes you know, through some resistors and stuff here, pull-ups and pull-downs and things like that. Um, and uh, through to the main chipset, so CPU, FPU, Budgie. Uh, two, well, that's a 244 some buffer I think sat near Lisa actually where some signals get buffered uh, and Lisa, Paula, uh, CIAs and Alice and then from there the ones that get buffered the reset signal gets buffered and uh, comes down to these things here so yeah it is a crazy uh, chain of uh, reset but as you can see I've ticked the main things off once I've gone round and checked where the the, the reset is okay, so I don't believe it's a reset problem. So I could be barking completely up the wrong tree here. I have no clues as to what the fault with this board is at the moment. 
but my thoughts are Polar CAA or Gale actually but I can't find a problematic signal do you know what I mean so it's like we know it's running super slow but why well the only thing I can think is timing I'm wondering if there's uh, some infinite well not infinite but very long delay waiting back on a timer now I did think about interrupts but I looked at the code for diagram and the interrupts are disabled and I spoke to Stephen Leary later and he was like oh he mentioned straight away as soon as I said wondered about interrupts and Paula he said uh, no the interrupts are disabled which confirmed what I'd already read and forgotten about uh, so it's not an interrupt problem it wouldn't appear to be which makes me think it's not likely to be Paula well it could be Paula I don't know so anyway, we'll just take this up. I've not added any additional flux there. Someone has soldered around this previously. But it's not got a uh, an analogic serial number like all the other chips that have been swapped out on here have. Now the thing is, you've got to remember, even though it's got chips with uh, you know have been clearly swapped out, and they were working, tested working at some point, they may have failed when this had been connected to a dodgy power supply. Unfortunately, you know, I've asked the question, what was wrong with the power supply? Was it like the 5 volts was 8 volts? Was it the, try someone mixed the 5 and the 12 around? What actually happened? But that's not clear. It's just, oh, we don't know. It's just a bad power supply. And then it stopped working. So... I really do not like removing these PLCC chips. The safest way by far to get these off if you're inexperienced is to get some low melting point solder chip quick and use that. Yeah, there we go, pads are all alright. So let's just uh, carefully uh, pull that off and put that somewhere else. This uh, braid does have a little bit of flux in it. It's the uh, Chemtronics one, I think. So that didn't solve it, and I didn't have a high level of confidence, but I wanted to rule it out anyway. We might still need to swap that one again. I'm not looking forward to removing that because it's so near to this. Anyway, the next thing we're going to do, switching on after about five or six seconds, this gets really warm on the bottom end. Nothing else does. So let's rule that out. I mean, a bad power supply, it could have killed anything. So I removed Paula there, that was twice as hard to remove as that CIA. Uh, I had a, just had that inkling that it was a temperature related thing. Now, I'm waiting for the sockets, I ordered the sockets well over a week ago, so they should arrive very soon. But I'm glad I took that Paula off, because you will not believe it. It's booting, it's booting perfectly. So there we go, I'm amazed that boots without a Paula. But you can see we've got a 2 mega chip RAM, the menu comes up, I'll just cycle the power just so you can See, it, it behaves totally normally, but obviously we're going to be missing interrupts. We're going to be missing this, the uh, mouse and stuff, some of the stuff there to do with that, the sound, uh, and some DMA uh, stuff probably, floppy drive as well. So, yeah, you can test these without a Paula. That's without a Paula, and it works. I'm tempted to just uh, plug a mouse in. Let me just do that. I don't think a mouse is going to work. Maybe it will, but the buttons won't work or something. No. Yeah, it's just not doing anything. So that is going to need a socket and a new Paula. I'm very pleased though. Do you know, I'm tempted to solder the replacement Paula I've got straight on there, actually. Um, mm, decisions, decisions. I've let Raj know that I believe it is the Paula. I mean, the clue was there all along when you think about it. I did say very early on it's getting warm, only a few seconds after power on, just on the bottom half here which I thought was a bit unusual. You tend to find that with normal usage, the heat would be within the center of the chip and it was the lower half of it. If you ever get uh, temperature variations like that on one part of a chip where it feels significantly hotter, then it's probably a clue there's something wrong with the internals of it. I'm surprised though, because as you saw, it had an analogic serial number on it. It was a new tested working part. It is the power supply that was connected to this that killed that. We don't know whether this CIA is any good yet. We don't even know whether my work there is any good yet. Until we get a Paula on, we can't really test anything properly. But we've definitely uh, got that far, haven't we? 
Uh, it's annoying I haven't got a keyboard I can connect to this because if I had a keyboard we could get a bit further perhaps. Right, Raj just said solder it on. You can see the warranty sticker here. I tried to peel it off. I didn't know it was one of these void ones. Uh, I'll just stick that back over there. But that's the one that was on there. I tried to pull it off so it wouldn't uh, be destroyed with the hot air. You can see all the bits of solder on it. Anyway, so I've got a brand new one here from the analog that I bought myself last week. Uh, and I bought this along with the CIA, as I say, to have some spares more than anything. Um, in some ways I would prefer to wait for a socket, but you know what, sockets, the less, the fewer sockets you have on the board the better. There's nothing wrong with the sockets I've fitted on here so far, we've got two, got one for the uh, GAL and one for uh, a CIA. Um, so yeah, they're fine, but we're just going to solder this straight on, because I've got a high level of confidence this board is rock solid without a Paula. I can't really see anything else on the board taking offence to Paula being there. So let's just assume it is that temperature thing and it is a bad polar. Anyway, I'll report back in a minute once I've got that uh, anchored in place. Right, I've anchored the chip on uh, two points there, not corners, it was hard with that cap there. So this corner here and up here and the chip is nice and straight. My ZX Kim fan uh, needs a new fan. You can see it's working but I've got a bit super close because it fell over and the blades broke on it. So I'm not going to be able to show you all of this because I cannot see what I'm doing from here, even through the viewfinder. So this case has just got some flux on there and dabbing into and then eventually drag along but the iron is still warming up as it was when I was covering uh, this stuff earlier on one of the A4000s. Let's just have a bit of a drag now. Yeah, it's not flowing very well there because as I say, this doesn't give off much in the way of heat. And these pins absorb a serious amount of heat. Can I get some bridges there? I can see one or two already. Anyway, I'll report back in a minute and I'll give you a close up and then we'll go test it. Well, I am very pleased today has turned out better than I thought it was. Actually, it was an awful start to the day. I've been feeling so unwell recently, but. Today, on a different medication, I'm starting to feel just a tiny bit better. Uh, you can see chip ram works okay there. Everything's working now. We've got Paula back on. Let's just uh, test the sound. Let me connect up the RCA connectors. All I need to do is finish cleaning up the board now and then give it a full test with, you know, PCM, CIA, serial parallel, floppy drive, hard disk, etc. But I think we are there. Let's do audio. Yep. Let's just uh, put them all on, do the filter. Yeah, you can hear that. So that's working. Test module. That's a good sign. So we know I've soldered Polar on correctly. <laughs> that's a good thing. Um, I'm going to stick Kickstart back in there now and we'll test it with IDE and stuff. So yeah, I'm very, very, very pleased, as you can imagine. So I need to desolder my Logic Probe wire. That's always a good thing to do when you're working on one of these. You know, earlier on I might have shown you, you can just, you know, carefully clip onto the floppy connector there, but you've got to be careful because it can short to the ground next to it. There's nowhere else on here, there's no other dip components to clip your Logic Probe onto. So just uh, measure around connectivity, you know, perhaps from one of these 7.4 series chips here and uh, find the positive, you know, the 5 volt side of one of these caps and just solder yourself a wire on. The grounds are easy because you can just clip onto these ground points here. Yeah, so anyway, so let's get the ROMs out. It was unfortunate I killed those ROMs earlier on on another board. It wasn't this board the one they died in, but uh, anyway, as I said, I've replaced them with a spare set of my own, so that's cost me. And that broke off as part of the testing here, so I had to solder it back on. So, uh, yeah, besides the crazy amount of flux and stuff, it's uh, cost me uh, a little bit in uh, parts and stuff here, you know. So, I think, now this, these are a mismatched set, but that's how they came to me. I need to make sure I get it rightly aligned there. I did it, nearly did it wrong there, didn't I? I would have fried them again. So, let's be careful. Yeah, we've got a bit of flexion in there. People are going to complain about that. They always do, but uh, you can't keep everybody happy. Right, let's, uh, let's just do a sense check. Pin one, pin one, that's correct. Switch it on. Yeah, so straight away, I think that's working. I saw a green line across the middle, and then it kind of, the grey sort of just changed a little bit as if it was doing something. 
So hopefully, there we go. Fantastic. I am so pleased. So, so, so pleased. You've probably heard me say that five times in the last few minutes. Right, let's get IDE connected. So this is where the one where these connections here were soldered together. But I don't think that was a big deal. It was like the weight signal and the halt signal or something. And one was the goes to this uh, PCMCI slot. One goes to the CPU and to Gale. And uh, I don't think that's a problem. If that was a problem, it wouldn't even be working. So let's just carefully get the IDE on. There's nothing underneath this that can short on this one, so we can uh, just leave it hanging there. Now yeah, I have my fingers and toes crossed here because I really don't want more problems like having to swap Gale again because there's an IDE fault, for example. That is not what I want to do. Now just looking at the IDE LED, it's not doing anything. Oh my goodness, don't tell me we've got an IDE fault on this. I really can't bear an IDE problem as well. Just reseated the card and it's not doing anything. And I mean nothing at all. Oh. Yeah, Diagram is not finding the IDE either. So, mm, I'm really worried now. I think it needs a new Gale. Oh god, I was having a bit of a senior moment. I'm trying to do the Gary test when you need to do the Gale test. Obviously it's got a totally different thing. Anyway, you can see I've just cleaned up the connector there, plugged the compact flash card in, and it's detected it on the first pass there. Uh, I'm just looking at the things there. Yeah, SMI model, that's correct. Uh, Rev 00323, I think that's right. And then the geometry is correct, and it found that on try one. So let's try it with Kickstart back in there again. So this hasn't been as plain sailing as I thought. The IDE, it was really weird. I like cleaned up around here, uh, didn't make a difference. And then I removed this out of the socket and changed over to the chip that I programmed up before. And from that point on, things started going really crazy. It was getting like a light blue screen, a yellow screen, a red screen. Uh, it was just, I couldn't get it back on. It would not boot again. I changed the chips around again, it wouldn't do anything. So I thought, I wonder if it's uh, two of the solder points here. So I reflowed that socket. It started working after that. So maybe I just had a bad solder point on those two connections that I thought looked like maybe they weren't great. All, all of them look fine now. So maybe that was a self inflicted problem. Uh, but anyway, you can see I've got PCM CIA connected, floppy drive over there. And we booted up to the desktop, no problems at all. If I click somewhere, We've got the expansion memory in there as well, so you can see we've got some additional RAM. Uh, if we go into empty, that's the PCM CIA card. Still got Battle Squadron on there. And if we launch that from the PCM CIA card, you can see that is starting to work. No worries at all. So, what was the issue? Was it just that socket? Was that causing problems with the IDE? I don't know. It's a little bit weird anyway, I need to do some thorough testing on this over the next 24 hours because uh, the other boards are all boxed up. This is one that I was going to look at later, but as things transpired, because they've not been able to collect it, that box, I've still got the box here and obviously I've now fixed this, so I've let Raj know if I now clean up and test this, it can go back with the other five boards, so that's a 6 out of 6 success rate on this particular series. So let's switch that off. I've got my serial and parallel loop backs here. And uh, I forget which way around these go now. That's the one for that port there, isn't it? Yep. And then this one goes there. That's the floppy drive. I will test the external floppy drive as well. Anyway, let's just connect those up and I'll stick a sys check into the floppy drive. I've got an opportunity to test the drive out as well. So thanks to Patreon support, I've been able to fix this camcorder. I've got a new tripod for it, I mean it's only cheap, like £15 cheap, and a new battery. So uh, yeah, it's uh, sprung a new lease of life into my camcorder. Uh, anyway, that seems alright, what was it going in here for? Serial parallel. Uh, hang on, wrong one. So let's do the serial port. Please work. Yep, that's good, parallel port. And again, please work. Oh yes. So, it is all looking good. The, the, mis the thing that's worrying me with this is the few random things leading up to this now working. I really don't know why the IDE was not working. Alright, we know why it wasn't working in Diagram. I was running the wrong test, but then why was it not doing anything? It was flashing the LED and not booting. 
That's interesting. It's freezing on that memory test there. That could be something to do with this expansion card though, because you can see here, it's configured to use 4 meg and 1.5 meg. Now, interestingly, a few people have had these cards and had exactly the same problem. It could be the expansion connector needing cleaning, but I'm just going to just switch it to 4 meg so it's not got the slow meg there, and test that. Um, but for one reason or another, not all of these A1200s um, that are out there work properly with some of the 8 meg boards you can now buy. I know one of my friends, uh, the person who sent me this one actually, he had no end of trouble with these. Um, let's just test that again, memory. See if it gets any further. And if that does work, I'll switch it back to the four, uh, five and a half meg mode. But yeah, you can see that's working. So I would suggest that on some of them, the addition of that slow RAM can be a problem. I don't know why. But it can be. I know Novabug's got a really weird problem with this A1200 as well. That some games don't work. None of this do, even though he's got enough RAM. Um, the only thing I can think with that is maybe it's, it's the dodgy compact flash card. Maybe I don't know. Some of the slave drivers need updating, or we need to, you know, uncorrupt versions of the game. Or it could be that he's running Kickstart 3. Now this is running Kickstart 3. I do know you get weird things with Kickstart 3 and WHD load. And what I mean by that, on the 4000s, I covered this in the uh, Terrible Fire series, you'll find that some games, there's a 50% chance of it black screening, you know, just freezing, when you start to load it. Are you coming out of the way, Rosa, or are you now taking over the channel? It looks like she's taking over the channel. Right, let's uh, just try that again. Yeah, it's booting all right. So I'll switch it back to five and a half meg mode. I'll tell you what it might be. It might be something to do with the uh, PCM CIA slot being in when we're testing it this way. So we'll just see if it freezes again. And if it does, I'll switch it off or remove the PCM CIA slot. Rosa. Come on, out of the way. Look, people can't see the amount of RAM. Down. Yes, frozen again. Look, so uh, we've got a pattern. All right, let's switch it off. I'm going to pull out the PCM CIA card. Just to now look, it's frozen again. That is really weird. That is really weird. But if I switch that off and put it into 8 meg, let's do that. It could be a case of this board needs a mod, like it needs a, a cap or mm, resistor change in some way, you know, pull up or pull down, adding or removing. I know there are lots of mods on these 1200s. Um, there's a couple of things you have to do there to get compatibility with some accelerator cards, I know that. And whilst I've been looking at these A1200 motherboards throughout this series here, one thing I have noticed, they're very different. The boards vary a lot. And by that I mean not just the revisions of the boards, but you can get two boards of exactly the same revision. You can see that's working now. Uh, yeah, two boards of exactly the same revision. And uh, there are differences, like, uh, Stuff to do with that, you know, the bodge area where you get the XU1 component, those can be different, but there can be caps missing or, you know, additional caps where there aren't on the other board, etc. So, yeah, it's going to be one of those. It's going to be a subtle difference somewhere that when someone, when they designed this card, didn't realise that if you enable the slow RAM for this particular revision board, you know, the way this one's configured, there's some sort of issue. Because you can see clearly, we disabled that slow RAM, we just went for 8 meg fast, happy as anything. No worries. And of course the one difference there is the address range. It's going to be in a, that slow RAM, sits in a different address. So let's say for argument, let's say one of the address lines on here is a bit flaky, a bit dirty or something. That would cause an issue, but then again, I think unlikely. So I'm going to rule that out anyway. I'll get some deoxit, I'll switch it off, remove the expansion card, clean up the edge connector and just try it one more time with the slow RAM enabled. Um, but I'm not going to focus on that too much because I have seen it before on other 1200s. So I've switched it off. Uh, yeah, this is another thing that uh, Patreon support helps with because I'm going to need another tube of this soon. This is about £7 a blooming tube for this tiny little tube here. Um, yeah, and the other benefit of Patreon, if you're not aware, is I have early access to videos. Uh, I mean, there's like five or so on there at the moment. So if you're bored and you want something to do, you could just catch up with all of the early access videos on Patreon. 
um, and I remove the advertising. You know, the advertising, the YouTube adverts don't go onto my videos when they're on Patreon. They only go up once they're public. Um, so yeah, there's a couple of advantages. And of course, if you go into the five dollar tier uh, Patreon uh, group, you get access to Discord. There's lots of like-minded people in there talking about uh, upgrades and repairs and things. Uh, we often help each other out with repairs on there offering advice you know where to look on the schematics what might be the cause of the problem and stuff so uh, yeah it's quite uh, a nice active community so let's connect it up again and obviously when you've got wires like that you need to be super careful no it's frozen at the exact same point there isn't it no i can't find anything but like i say i do know one or two people have had problems with this board in terms of certain compatibility modes you know if you go to 8 meg it'll work but obviously you get problems with PCM CIA and the 4 meg will work but the 5.5 meg I don't know I don't, don't know what the issue is I think this board needs a mod it needs a pull up or a pull down or a cap or something but if we switch that back to 4 meg so I'll continue to test it that way but yeah the point I was going to make there this is the card I repaired in a previous video it's got a brand new connector there and all the pins here are good so it's definitely not that and the socket on the board looks fine not the socket you know the edge connector here it looks fine and I don't see any corrosion there I will just inspect that again in a minute but I don't think that's the issue so I've got the wrist strap on here I'm just cleaning up the uh, of the CIA the one we took off because I want to take this and put this back on there and test it with its original CIA I suspect it's all it's been a pull all along on this board but those bridged solder points wouldn't have helped Anyway, we'll give this a nice clean before we fit it back on in the socket. If you're unsure whether something's faulty, that's where sockets really help out. One of the things that makes the 1200 and the 4000 difficult to work on is the fact everything's surface mounted and nothing is socketed from the factory. Now you can see that looks like new. So we'll go and get that into the socket. So I switched that off, just grounding myself. Uh, I'm just going to pull that off out of the way just to allow me a bit of access. In fact, let's just disconnect the drive entirely. You can't use a PLCC extractor with these, it's near impossible because the low profile, they're so low, you've got to just try and lift up without putting too much pressure on the edge there. This side's going to be hard because of the connector there. If we just lift it, there we go. On that side again. There we go, it's almost out. So this is the new one I got from Analogic, which I wanted for myself as a spare. We know that works okay. I can put that into an ESD bag. Um, uh, yeah, I've got myself a spare now, that's good. It makes diagnosing problems like this much easier when you've got a spare and you've got a socket. But yeah, it's original CIA signaling is okay. So I tested it for a number of hours here and it's been rock solid so I'm very pleased. One thing I'm going to do is just swap the gal over and just test my uh, the one I programmed earlier just to see if that works. So now that's working we'll just clean up uh, around Paul here get all this flux off there. I'll remove that wire and we'll just inspect see if anything else needs uh, any more uh, work. The final thing I need to do on this is just test the joystick port. Mouse port works, serial parallel, everything else. It's just that joystick port we haven't tested. And the worrying thing with this is this is what this first had. The very, very first fault, I think, on this was a controller problem, a button not working or something. That might have related to the Paula. I don't know, maybe the Paula was always on its uh, last legs. I honestly can't remember where the buttons go now. I think they uh, might go to the CIAs, actually. So I will just uh, pull my uh, test wire off here and that's uh, for good measure just have a bob into that, that looks okay and we'll give it a little clean with some IPA I'll clean this area anyway, it's not had a clean just down here In case you're wondering, this area here is not popular, this is for the FPU I've got some of those sockets actually, I was thinking about mounting one of those on mine when I come to fix my 1200 because there's an issue with it it's got a bit of a colour 
issue my 1200 so pin one is on this side here I'm uh, literally just going to get some of this uh, rubbery elastic -y glue here just a little bit like that you can see that and we'll get the pin one notch towards the right hand side here we'll just drop it into position there and uh, just press it down yeah you can get that off really easy yeah the bit of IPA you could peel that off but the main thing is it's gonna stick like that inside there now if we just get the CIA back in so uh, the slant is up here it just means we can't push it too far yeah there we go so I'm going to do a recap on this final board now I'll show you some of the work here now you can see uh, a few things are marked here can you see these ones with red cross these ones have identified where you can see they've leaked so they're obvious but you know we will replace all of the caps now I haven't got any of the uh, caps that would fit this board left out of the stuff that the company sent me um, but I have got a uh, retro bench uh, kit here from ages ago that was donated to the channel. Um, I'm going to use that because I've since bought a Pollen one just before they stopped trading. Um, I think they did it to spend more time with the family. Um, yeah, they're really, really good cap kits. I hope they make a comeback at some point, maybe, I don't know, in a year or something when uh, you know things have got a bit more normal with the world and stuff and maybe they have a bit more time but anyway yeah really miss I'm gonna miss those guys because the cap kits are just amazing and I bought uh, a few others actually uh, just before they stopped uh, trading but since we're gonna remove all of them now uh, I'm just gonna mark up them all with a red dot because instead of just me you know going through and removing them first and then fitting the other caps I tend to remove a batch of a certain size and then fit a certain size and if you've marked them all up with red tops like this you know exactly which ones the old ones are there's different ways of doing this you could just mark the ones you've done with a red dot but yeah I just find that this is perhaps for me personally the easiest approach yeah they've all got red dots on there so by far the best thing to do uh, in order to prep these if you like is to just go around and uh, solder onto each cap pad now some interesting uh, observations things I'll point out in the cap kit there are a number of things that account for different board revisions you know you only have to fit a cap here if you've got a certain board revision the currently missing cap up here and one of them I think the later boards are the 2B or 2 revisions I've got a tantalum here but with that position there there's nothing to stop you fitting a tantalum actually you could do that and similarly you could fit the extra cap here it's not really going to have any detrimental effect I don't think um, I will look at the schematics, I'll see where that sits, but I think that's just an additional cap on the video smoothing circuit perhaps. Anyway, I'm not going to show you every single one of these, I'm going to be skirting through it just like I've done throughout this whole series here, because it gets kind of boring doesn't it, you just watch the same things over and over again. Um, but yeah, we'll just uh, heat, there you go, and lob them off. That one's corroded, there we go, it's off. Yeah, this one could take a few seconds. Wow, I smell fish. Yeah, it's on the left hand side, it is not melting, there we go. Right, let's just get those ones out of the way. As I say, this would be easier if I remove that through hole, but this is coming off anyway, and it's going to go in the bin ultimately. So, I'm not bothered about it melting a little bit. You can hear that bubbling. There we go. Wow, that was bad. Anyway, you get the general idea. I will report back once we've... Uh, cleaned up these pads here, it's got those two to remove, I'll do those next. So we're getting there, nearly done. You can see with this here I've just clipped the top of the housing off, three layers of captain tape. It's very difficult to do this one 
I try and press on to the actual cap. Don't worry about heating the actual cap because otherwise you will melt the uh, connector there. You can't see what I'm doing there just because of the weird angle. Hang on. And then we'll use uh, this one down here, I think. See, like that's struggling to melt. Again, press into the cap. I really hate doing this one. Oh. There we go. Leave the captain's tape in place just to allow you to try and solder it without uh, touching the plastics and things, you know. I'm going to use the solder sucker here, actually. There's that much blooming solder there. Uh, and that's because of me. I used a lot of solder. Right, recap complete. I bought tantalum back here. Tantalums are better uh, for that kind of thing. And uh, as I say, the Rev 2. That's one of the changes they did. Now, all of the caps on this were okay, apart from these two. Can you see I had to, the pad on this side was floating a little bit, so I had to join over here, a little bit of wire. So this one's fairly stable. This one, however, can you see it wobbles? I've literally had to use a piece of kynar to the trace there and a piece of kynar through the wire to the other side. That one was really, really bad. Uh, and it's no surprise because that's where the corrosion was around those two. So in order to, to secure these, I've cut a little piece of hot melt glue, you can see. I'm going to wedge it with a bit of hot air and melt it. Do the same on the other side and then do the same between this, the left one of these two caps here and the black cap there. Just to give these a bit of security because any kind of uh, impact, and we'll try and get it to go down onto the board a bit as well, any kind of impact, you're going to break the uh, connections there. Yeah, there you go. So yeah, I covered this technique before, it's quite a nice easy way of getting hot melt glue in exactly the right place you want without any streaks and stuff. Uh, and obviously you can limit the amount. I just want a little bit to support it. If I just get the glue down there, like that, and then kind of sit it so you can see where it is, and then I'm gonna heat it like that. I'm having to do it this way so that it sags downwards when it melts. Yeah, so there we go. That is still drying, but you can see, in fact, you can see it moving because obviously this is still molten. But that's just going to provide a little bit of stability to this cap in particular because there's a bit of glue wedging it there, a bit here, a bit there, and a bit there. Yeah, so I think that that will be okay. Because the thing is, all you need is when you're connecting the idea here to knock these caps, they're going to come detached. It could even be worse, it could come detached and short to another rail or something, so you want some stability and security uh, around there. There's no other way to deal with that. On one video, I had a guy saying, that is the most unprofessional repair ever. You need to replace the pads and traces. You know, you can get replacement, I don't know, pad kits. What, and you're going to epoxy it down and stuff? And it's like when you heat, I've seen these kits before, I've tried them, and I've tried using epoxy, and I've tried using super glue. When you try and glue these down, if you're really lucky, it may stay weakly adhered to the PCB, but any kind of knock, it breaks off. Uh, and more often than not, when you heat it, it comes detached anyway. So, uh, yeah, you need to do some like this. This is exactly what we did on the A3640 PCB for Andy. And a final look at the final board here. So, yeah, it was unfortunate that I didn't try Paula before we tried the CIA, but I wanted to test my spare anyway. It was good having that socketed because I've been able to test my spare and then put the original one back on uh, and then make sure, obviously, that's okay. So, yeah, caps replaced around there. Um, this one was the one that was marked with... Originally, it had a, some sort of controller issue and then uh, it was connected up to a dodgy power supply. Um, someone replaced a number of things on here, you know, you can see the uh, analogic part numbers uh, on here all over the place. That even looks like that's been replaced actually, it looks like pretty much everything had been replaced. So it was uh, limited as to what was potentially going to be the problem, but the power supply could have killed something that was swapped previously. We don't know what was swapped before the power supply went bad on this. 
I borrowed the DAT right at the start from this actually, so that's why that's uh, got a serial number because that was a replacement. Yeah, because this board was beyond seemingly at the start. I borrowed the DAC to fix one of the other 1200s uh, right at the very uh, start of the 1200 series. And you can see all the caps have uh, been replaced all around this, so it didn't melt anything or touch anything. It's uh, come out really well, that board actually, uh, and it's pretty good on both sides. There's nothing really more needs to be done to that board I don't think. What was weird is the IDE problem I had when I first got this working but I think that that was just something to do with a bad connection here and it wasn't just the IDE problem it started doing like I say weird things with this display that has not reoccurred since I reflowed the connections there so uh, yeah uh, and, and the reason we did that obviously was uh, just to rule out problems with the DSAC uh, one uh, signal I think it was or a DSX zero. Stephen Leary kindly said uh, you know he didn't think as I mentioned earlier didn't think it'd be interrupts but it could be something wrong with this, that those particular signals. Now I looked at them on the scope uh, and they looked okay um, so the, I guess the final thing was the polar. So what caused this well as I mentioned earlier when I was theorizing I think it was an interrupt thing so even though there were no interrupts being raised by anything I think this was kind of in an interrupt mode where you know that's what was delaying the process and this was kind of like doing something um, or inhibiting you know some of those signals slowing those signals down because this thought it was having to wait for something or something like that I mean the timers come from these but this is like a, an interrupt controller as far as I understand uh, yeah so hopefully you found the series interesting for me personally it was very interesting to look at these faults on the 1200s the 4000s not so much because we've looked at them four or five times prior to uh, you know the the pairs you've seen uh, on this series uh, but the 1200s yeah we had the, a nice varied mix of things it was interesting we ended up with a pull on this one but we've had a DAC problem on one of them we had a green screen caused by uh, RAM we had a few things bridged on this board as well didn't we um, I forget what happened on the other boards uh, so I recapped three of these boards fully and the fourth one as I may have mentioned earlier I'm not sure I didn't have quite enough caps I didn't have that 100 so it needs the 100s replacing on that other board I think um, and maybe the 10s I'm not sure but everything else on that other board had been done and here is kind of my reward for doing this uh, now it's thanks to Stefan for arranging for this but also I think Stefan bought half of these himself out of his own money so I'm very grateful to both uh, Stefan uh, and I'm sure you've guessed it by now it's Analogic as the company and then we've got this bag of bits to go back so I'm just going to tape this the same way it came to me so this is partially working it will work in terms of chip ram it gets super 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 hot uh, and I, I think it's a problem with the uh, Zorro side on that I'm pretty certain of it unless someone tells me that those ones always run hot versus the other ones anyway I'll tape that up in a sec and we've got a bag of faulty parts here so I killed those uh, ROMs there and we've got an awful lot of caps there, caps from three A1200s, two A4000s, uh, and then there's the odd other component in there, I think we've got the uh, the DAC there off one of the 1200s, uh, I think that's probably about it actually, in summary, there's a carrier thing in there, let's just get rid of that, I don't know why, how that got in there, anyway so yeah I'll send all that back, I'll just mark this up to say faulty parts, the, again the DAC is, uh, well you could use it for testing, the problem with the blue on that but it will actually output a display so that's the sort of thing that it's kind of worth keeping uh, the ROMs though are toasted and looking back at the polar on the diagram here I felt it was worth just revisiting this uh, the issue with it running really really slowly um, as I mentioned you know interrupts are disabled in diagram so you know Stephen was uh, the opinion you know, it could it probably isn't interrupts and that's what I thought as well but you've got to think if there's a fault with the interrupt side of things it doesn't matter if interrupts are disabled in some systems you can disable interrupts within the processor so I'm not sure if they were disabled in the 68020 but I think that's what these are here IPL um, and you've got three connections that uh, come from Paul so I'm just wondering if I mean what else have you got you got a DMA signal uh, yeah it has to be something related to that I'm thinking these IPL lines now incidentally that's the only thing I didn't really scope I should have scoped that in retrospect I think if we'd scoped this on the CPU we may have seen some activity here uh, you know these are active low it's got the, the little underscore uh, as a prefix Anything, any of these signal names where you see it an underscore in front of something like 
reset for example has got one there shows you this active low I don't always explain that but nevertheless these IPL signals here are active low so I can't help but wonder if the fault in Paula meant that it was kind of raising an interrupt with the CPU um, on a fairly frequent basis because that's the sort of thing that could slow the system down I'm kicking myself that I didn't measure that but maybe that was where the issue was so those boards were received back okay. I think, uh, from what I understand, he's not been able to test the 4000s. He perhaps needs a CPU card. So maybe I could have a look at one of those for him uh, at some point soon. But my health is... I've got significant health problems at the moment. I've got high level of calcium, a super low level of vitamin D. Hopefully, I'll be able to balance this out. Anyway, long story short, he uh, sent uh, these as replacements. So that's the CIA you saw me test. You can tell because I've got that open there. That's the one we tested, so that was mine. Um, but I asked him about this and just chased this the other day. I said, have you had a chance to send it, uh, my replacement poorly yet? And he says, yeah, no worries. And I've sent you a couple of CIAs too. So that was really nice of him, actually, because that mean now means I've got three <laughs> spare CIAs, which is, is great. It's always nice to have more than one spare of these kind of things whilst these don't fail as much in uh, 1200s and 600s and 4000s as they do in 500s uh, the possibility of the failure is pretty much just the same you know so plugging and unplugging things on the joystick ports in some systems you can you've got more chance of killing things so if you like this video please give it a thumbs up uh, consider subscribing and if you'd like to support the continuation of the channel please see the patreon and coffee links down below Another special thanks to Stefan Scotti for arranging this with Raj and as I mentioned earlier, thanks for Raj for trusting me to work on these. These are the odd hair and stuff, we'll get those off, but this one is about to go back. Anyway, hopefully you found that interesting, catch you in the next video.